This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org. Potters, are you looking for high-quality equipment and supplies? Since 1974, Bailey Pottery Equipment, based in Kingston, New York, has produced equipment used in schools, universities, and art centers nationwide. Their gas kilns, renowned for ease of use, fuel efficiency, and beautiful results, are a global favorite. Bailey Pottery Equipment caters to all skill levels, offering a range of equipment and top brand ceramic supplies at discounted prices, all backed by their outstanding personal service. Visit baileypottery.com, the professional's choice for all things clay. Hey folks, Sunshine Cobb here, ceramic artist and current resident coordinator at the Bray. I'm excited to announce that our application portal is now open for our 2025 residency cohort. Applications are due by December 19th, 2024. For details on all our residencies available, head to archibray.org slash residencies. Please help us spread the word about this amazing new opportunity at the Bray. Thanks so much. Hello, my name is Kathy King, and welcome to the For Flux Sake podcast. I'm coming to you from the Harvard Ceramics Program in our fair city, Alston, Massachusetts. I'm here with Rose and Matt Katz of the world-famous Ceramic Materials Workshop, and they are ready to answer your burning questions about clay and glaze. Well, hello, Matt and Rose. Hey, Kathy. Hello, Kathy. Don't y'all just love fall? <laughs> oh, it's my favorite time of the year. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> it is. Fall in New England is magical. Oh, and today, really the episode, the day this episode's coming out, my father's birthday. Doesn't listen to the oh. podcast, I guarantee you, but happy <laughs> birthday, Opa. <laughs> I doubt it. Yes. Well, many people have thanked him, though, because he was featured in the awesome episode with uh, Rose about mm-hmm. pregnancy and working in ceramics. And I know I have given out that link to so many people in the studio who have announced their uh, pregnancies and want to know if it's safe or not. And that has been just great to have. Excellent. We were, th- we were thrilled to put that episode out. Yeah, that was a fun mm-hmm. one. Hey, y'all, before we get to it, I've been, you know, looking at the interwebs and the TikToks, and it it seems to me I see a lot of very successful, well-known potters who are, you know, doing that zoom in, picking the glaze piece out of the kiln and just showing off five trillion crackles in their glaze. <laughs> And it's funny to me because we, this constantly comes up, you know, and are they just rogue? Are they taboo? <laughs> are we rogue potters? completely full of poop? I mean, like, what, <laughs> what is going on? Are, are we giving a damn when we shouldn't? <laughs> right. Or is it just fancy Nancy Kathy over here who never has any crazes on their pots? <laughs> oh, no, I do. But I do, but I don't sell it, you know? <laughs> right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, you said the key word, which is crackle. <laughs> ASMR crackle. You know, crackle. <laughs> it's not the crazy. Is, it's not crazy. <laughs> but that's the joke in ceramic engineering, is that you call it crackle when you're calling it a feature, and you're calling it crazing when you're seeing it as a flaw. Uh, <laughs> but let's be clear, crackle and crazing are exactly the same thing. There is no difference between them. Um, the tile industry, <laughs> as Rose will, say, <laughs> Rose will know, is the worst. <laughs> They're really the ones that push crackle. Um, so you buy crackle tile. Yes. But it is crazing. That is the technical term for it. That's the realistic term. And it is cracking in the glaze. The glazes are literally cracking. And that's what you see going on. You know, everybody has their impression of is crazing good or is it bad? Is it dangerous? Is it this? Is it that? 
you know, it, it, it it's a double edged sword. It, it's a cool effect. It's been going on for millennium. You know, there are ancient Chinese celadons where they were rubbing inks mm -hmm. and dirt and, you know, other things into the crazes and that makes them pop and gives you all of the visual, um, the visual impression of it. And that certainly is uh, a nice feature. I'm not going to critique that. The, the, you know, my perspective is always the, the technical side of it and, and sort of what the problem is. Um, and it, it is literally the glaze cracking. And when you look at them under a powerful microscope, um, you can see it's like a, it's like a, a rift Valley through a mountain that it's just a, it's a crack and it goes all the way down to the clay body. It, it is very real. The bad. Mariana trench of glazes. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. The depths. <laughs> that would be like a Shino, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and there are different ways to force crazing. Like some of the the old ones like the long quan celadons they would put them on really thick and that's something some of you may have noticed that glazes will craze more as they get thicker oh is that like the snowflake crazing that you see yeah and then there's snowflake crackle fish scale crackle whatever they call them those tend to be very very thick glaze applications they're, they're also specific chemistries um what what crazing is, and everybody again has their own impression, and all that, but th there is only one cause of crazing. So let's just set that out. Crazing is caused by this concept of thermal expansion. And we mentioned thermal expansion on the show all the time. And that is that every single material on the planet, not just ceramics, but metal and concrete, and whatever, they all expand when you heat and cool them. The problem that we have in ceramics is that your glaze is going to have a thermal expansion of X and your clay body is going to have a thermal expansion of Y. If the difference between X and Y is too extreme, the glaze is going to crack to relieve the stress. That's crazy. It does work in the opposite way, where if the clay body's expansion is going in the wrong direction, it will shiver, which is when the clay body essentially crazes to relieve the stress. But you don't see shivering as much, but you see a lot of crazing. And no, it makes no difference when you open the kiln. If crazing <laughs> is going to happen, it is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Full stop. So wait, if I so like if I open the kiln at like fifty degrees Fahrenheit, it's gonna and it crazes. You mean I opened it too soon? No, it's gonna <laughs> do it no who, matter who what. Who opens at fifty degrees? Fahrenheit? I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm sure there's cold somebody. winter morning. <laughs> Someone really, really patient <laughs> in a cold a atmosphere. Yeah, but mm -hmm. we will open up our kiln at 300 degrees Celsius, which is like 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And yeah, you'll hear it go ping, 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 and that's crazing taking place. And everybody's got their opinion. We we put out a YouTube video not long ago and, you know, that there, Rosen made a comment on it about this being a perfect glaze. And somebody in the comments is like, well, how can you call it perfect when it's glazing? And the answer is because it's based on the glaze and the clay body. This is why you all will see the problem where you'll have a glaze that'll craze on your porcelain, but not your stoneware, because those two clay bodies have different thermal expansion. Not all clay bodies have the same thermal expansion. And so on the porcelain, the difference is enough to cause it to craze, and on the stoneware, it's enough to cause it not. So you look at a glaze that crazes, don't judge the glaze. It's about the clay body it's on too. Um, so there's certainly that. The next thing that people freak out about is, is it sanitary for crazing? Because they are literally rifts that go into the clay body. And the answer is, if the clay body is vitrified, it's perfectly fine. Now, if it's not vitrified, you definitely can get water that'll penetrate the crazes and then get into the clay and grow mold. That absolutely does mm -hmm. happen. Or I've seen it too, where like water has gone down into the craze, discolored the clay body. And like, and it's permanent. It's you can like see it sweat under there yeah. when the water will soak in. It's really ew. gross. <clears throat> yeah, it was right. Okay. <laughs> Ryan Coopage uh, did a study that he published in Ceramics Monthly back in 2018, where they tried to embed bacteria into crazes. And it, um, and then they put it through modern sanitation, and it all cleared away. So it really isn't a thing. The bigger problem is crazing makes work substantially physically weaker. And um, one of Dr. Cardi's graduate students, Brian Pinto, had done a study on it. And work can be up to 75% weaker in the fired state if it's crazed because those crazes cause what we call a critical failure location where if there's stress, you know, if you're doing a cheers and you tap your mugs together, that force will 
ripple through the crazes and will cause the pots to break. So wait, that's just not my strength. That's just not my like, <laughs> it's like, I'm just you're, not that strong. Are you fervor. telling me? Yeah. yeah. Rose cats. She hung. I know. <laughs> I'd believe it. I'd believe it. Wow. Well, I am sure this will come up again, but that was, that was good to revisit it that for that moment. But, we have so many great questions to get to, so let us pivot towards Mag from Oregon, who has a question about porcelain. Hello, for Flux sake. Um, this is Mag from Oregon. Thank you for um, the show. It's great. I've learned a lot. Uh, and also, um, I'm in a competition with a part of friends about how many times we get questions answered on your show. So this one would be my third time. So please speak. Um, my question is, is there an actual technical definition of porcelain and what makes porcelain porcelain? Uh, I read that like it's supposed to go at higher temperature than stoneware, but then there's con six porcelain. Um, I wonder if it's the amount of kaolin because some porcelain are wider than others. And then uh, is it, should it be translucent? Uh, so yeah, just uh, what, what, what makes porcelain and porcelain compared to like a white stoneware? Thank you. Wow. Producer Ben, are you taking payments from Mag from Oregon? <laughs> really? Get on th and, and her partner? <laughs> We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> we'll go off air. I would know what other games are happening. <laughs> Let's just say that uh, pay for my vacations. <laughs> <laughs> Jersey Shore, here comes Ben. <laughs> <laughs> exotic you know i guess my question for all y'all is what's your definitions of porcelain Ooh. i mean I, I guess i i learned to define it as it's different it's a primary clay and which makes it different than secondary clays in how it was formed um by the uh you know presence of uh, predominantly kaolin and uh that I, as I understand it, geologically, uh, it was created by compression as opposed to uh, secondary clays where you have, um, say, granite being affected by wind, rain, glacial movement over time and picking up organic matter as it travels, you know, down the mountain along the riverbed type of thing. I mean, that, that went on a tangent there, but... <laughs> That never happens on this show, right? <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, not at all. But that's that's like the, my base understanding of it. Sure. Rose, what do you think porcelain is? Well, I get to go back to my days as a student and uh, tell you about the time I was in glaze calc class and there was talk about asteroids and stardust <laughs> and I didn't anomalies. Teach this class. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> that uh I didn't learn a damn thing in. <laughs> so um I'm gonna say, I mean, from what I would define porcelain as is so a white primary kaolin, mostly kaolin. Um, and doesn't need to be translucent, just as a, a, a white clay body. Um, you typically high fire, but can be any temperature. And so. producer Ben, let's let's go all the way around the horn. What's your definition as a red mm -hmm. as the mm -hmm. red potter in the room? What's your mm -hmm. definition of porcelain? That it's dangerous, horrible material you should avoid at all costs. <laughs> 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 no, that it's that it just needs to be a white vitrifying primary kaolin is what I know it is. But then I had to ask Wikipedia what it was because I did a little yeah. Googling. Cheater. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> of course it gives like eight paragraphs that don't pertain to what I'm thinking about. But the word itself comes from the old Italian porcelana, which actually was cowrie shells. The the oh. dirtier definition is that it comes from the concept of a sow's ear, or this is a family show, so I won't get into the full definition, but a more intimate part of a sow, it is often referred to as being soft and white. I am not kidding. Yeah. See a doctor. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Consult your physician. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, most of those are pretty close, but I ask because it does not have a definition. Um, and that's one of the more interesting things. An art historian friend of mine had actually emailed me about this not long ago and, and we were sort of discussing it because, um, he's very interested in, um, industrial ceramics and he had a product that was called an iron stone, but it was a white clay. And he said, I thought this was porcelain and, you know, sort of went back and forth with that. And, and the, 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 the best answer that I would give is that it is a, a, a pure white vitrified clay. That is the simplest answer. Now there are so many variables in that, like pure white, <laughs> um, and, and things like that. But in general, the whiteness is the important factor. Um, so going into some of that, of course, it is made from kaolin, as everybody named. Um, Y'all said primary kaolin. That's not exactly accurate. Kaolin comes in two forms. There are primary and secondary kaolins. Um, and what Kathy was saying was close, but not exactly it. And actually, this I just learned recently at my advanced age, because um, I was re-examining uh, my coursework on geology, which is always the weak spot in my classes. Um, kaolin is formed from a uh, granite and granite as a rock species is what most mountains are made out of. Um, and granite is generally made up of feldspars. Okay. So feldspar is sort of the base rock. 50% of the earth is made up of feldspars. Feldspars go through a process called kaolinization where they are basically washed and they lose components like sodium and potassium and they get left with silica and alumina. And that turns into this mineral kaolin. The secondary versus the primary kaolin thing is what I actually learned recently. I'd always been taught, as Kathy was saying, that a secondary kaolin had been washed away. In the US, we see this famously, that the kaolin deposits are in Georgia and Florida and South Carolina. And those are the decomposed Appalachian Mountains that they literally washed down from the mountaintops and became these secondary kaolin deposits. Primary kaolins go through the exact same process of kaolinization of feldspar, but they don't move anywhere. So literally the water just seeps through the rocks in that location. And so they don't get transported. So that's the difference between the secondary and the primary kaolins. And kaolin in and of itself is white. And this is one of the interesting features about what porcelain was, because in the past, white was a very rare thing, right? The world was a disgusting and dirty place. And so to have a material that came out of the earth that was pure white was really different than if you were living, you know, in the 1700s in London and the world was full of wood smoke and coal smoke and horse dung and dirt and everything. And to have this white thing made it so de de desirable. And of course, there's a whole history of European porcelain I won't get into. But the whiteness is a huge factor. Now, where things get into more of a variable are some of the other terms that y'all were using, which is the translucency. Porcelain oftentimes can be translucent. And what that means is that if you hold it up to a light source, you can see shadows through it. You can see the shadows of your hand through the clay. That is because porcelain is vitrified. Vitrification means to become glass. And porcelain is glass largely. And so because glass is transparent, porcelain has that ability. But glass is transparent Porcelain is translucent, which means the light can travel through it, but it gets diffracted because in porcelain, when we form glass, we also form another mineral called mullite. And we like to think of this as muscles and bones. So in your, in your, your body, you're made up of muscles and bones and your muscles can be big and huge. But if you didn't have a skeleton, those muscles would just be a pile of jelly right? And your bones are strong and hard, but if they didn't have muscles, they couldn't move. Our vitrified clays are the same. The glass is the muscles. It's the physical thing that makes it strong and tough. But this mullite that forms is what gives us the skeletal structure that allows the glass to keep its shape when we fire it, okay? And because we're forming glass, that allows the light to travel through it, but the mullite diffracts the glass. It bends the light so you don't see quite through it. And so you can see translucency, the light passing through it, but not the um, uh, transparency. So it can be translucent, but translucency is sort of fleeting. It depends on how much mullite you form, how much glass you form, how thick the work is. Those of you who've got translucent pots, like if you've got old china, go and hold those up to the light. And what you'll see is like, you can see your fingers through like the center of a plate, but where the foot is, where the clay is thicker, you can't see it because there's literally just more mullite that diffracts the light. So that is certainly a thing. 
but the whiteness um, and the vitrification and the translucency is generally where those lines sort of go. And then as clay gets more contaminated with things like iron and titanium, which are naturally occurring in the earth, iron is brown and so clays start to become more brown and that's where the stone wears come in and that eventually into the earthen wares and those are literally just about having more and more iron content in those clays that you're using so that's generally where the technical definition goes but there's no one thing the last one i'll think say from a recipe standpoint is when you're composing clay bodies porcelains will tend to have a lot less of that kaolin in them than something like a stoneware Porcelains will generally have about 50% of their recipe being kaolin and the other 50% split between feldspar and quartz. Stonewares will have 80 or 90% kaolinitic species and then the remaining 10 to 20% feldspar and quartz. And that's because stonewares don't care about translucency. That mullite that we form is actually forming from the kaolin. And so if you want things to be more translucent, you'd need less kaolin. And about 50% is as far as you can lower it and still have that clay body hand formable so you can throw or sculpt or whatever. But when you're making stoneware, it doesn't need to be translucent. So you just put in a ton of clay because it just is easier to work. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of what it's not. Mm -hmm. Well... If you're done publicly shaming us for not getting the right answer, <laughs> we can perhaps move on from this subject, Mag. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and Mag gets banned from the show. You're I stopping know. at three, Mag. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed that fourth time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. So our next question comes from a very talented potter from Atlanta, Georgia, Randall Moody. Randall, hey. And Randall <laughs> has a question uh, that he wrote in. We always love audio. We love hearing your voice. But we will make an exception. Randall wants to know, what does bentonite actually do in a glaze beside preventing hard panning? I hate dealing with bentonite, succinctly put. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> dealing with bentonite is not fun. No, and that that's pretty much what it does. And in fact, that's why we use the bentonite is because it prevents hard panning. Those of you who don't know, hard panning is when the glaze is a rock. You know, you come to your bucket of glaze and there's a layer of clear water and a solid rock on the bottom. That's hard panning. It's the, the material settling to the bottom of the bucket. And then it's just um, not suspended anymore. But this came up in our studio because for just using the same glaze recipes for such a long time, um, making the distinction when we're training our glaze mixers that the bentonite doesn't necessarily need to be in that recipe. It's it's an additive. And the problem was that, you know, no one was treating it like an additive. <laughs> They're treating it like the regular recipe. So we had to kind of extract all the bentonite out of the glazes just to like kind of check in and see well is it really hard panning like do we really mm -hmm. need this in it mm -hmm. and it was interesting like i think things had changed over time so some did and some did there is definitely a defensive bent night out in the mm. world where <laughs> a, a lot of people will go and put just like bent night in every recipe because they think that they need it and as you say you don't. It's really not worth putting in there unless you know that that glaze is hard panning. Now, if it's the first time you mix up a glaze and you just go straight to batch, which don't do that, uh, you know, test it first that you'll, you know, you'll know if it's going to hard pan or not. Um, but a lot of people will just sort of like cover their butts and put the bentonite in there when you don't need it. And then recipes get passed down and whatever. But yeah, as you say, if, if it's not hard panning, I wouldn't bother. So make sure it's hard panning first. Um, bentonite in itself, it's a clay, it's a type of clay like kaolin we were just talking about, but it's a different chemistry and structure of clay, but it's literally made of silicon alumina, um, and it expands when you mix it with water and that expansion sort of increases its size and that helps to keep all the rest of the particles suspended. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's not a huge trick to it. There's things to, not to do with it. Don't try to put bentonite in an existing glaze because it'll just expand when you mix it with water and then it won't homogenize. You need to put it in with the dry the materials. Or yeah, with yeah, the, powder. the powder. Put it in with the powder and don't try to mix it into a wet glaze because that's just not going to do what you <laughs> want it to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll just get like 
Yeah, a nice gum oh. layer somewhere it's like in there. like one of those Stuck tiny little side. dinosaur sponges that you put in water oh. and it gets really <laughs> big. <laughs> Look what I made! <laughs> we don't want those in our glazes, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so mix it in with your dry powders and then add that in if you have a glaze that's hard panning don't go and add bentonite to it that's when you want to move to an epsom salt solution and epsom salts will generally help to keep it suspended for a glaze that has already hard panned mm -hmm. if you think that you need bentonite what would the starting point be like what's the average percentage that you would start with two percent um, 2%. just 2% is, is pretty much all that any glaze ever needs. Oh man. Somebody showed me a glaze recipe recently that had like 7% bentonite and I have <laughs> never like felt my internal organs twist so quickly. I was like, why do you hate yourself? What, what, is, what, what kind of penance is this? It's so sad. <laughs> there is, there is no reason, you know, okay. 3% fine, but you, you really don't need more than that. And and the glaze will start to get gummy. It'll start to get thick. Um, like Rose is saying, it'll just turn. It. And longevity will be awful. Like it, it won't, won't last long. Yeah. So 2%, maybe three. The, the only other thing I will say is you will often see people include bentonite with the colorants. It's not a colorant, everybody. I think they do it because that 2% seems like a colorant amount. It technically is silicon alumina. When I'm writing my glaze recipes and I'm looking at the chemistry, I put it in with the base ingredients, but it's always just a default 2% across the board if I need. Like I was writing glaze recipes last week and I had a set, I, they didn't have any kaolin in them. So just like 2% across the board. You don't need to adjust it. You don't need to compensate for its chemistry for the hardcore nerds out there. The contributions of silicon alumina are so small. It, it really is basically not even worth noting and you need it for the suspension anyway. So, you know, just, just 2% should keep it, but put it in the dry mix, not in the wet. Excellent. Words to live by. So let's go on to our next question. And this one comes from Justina from the great country of Poland. And uh, Justina wants to know what's so special about Bristol glazes. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kathy, Rose and Matt. My name is Justyna. I'm from Warsaw, Poland. I'm a hobby ceramicist and a professional translator. And I've just managed to translate and publish in Poland the craft and art of clay by Susan Peterson. And I have so many questions after working with this book. The first one is about Bristol glazes. The question is, what is so special about these glazes? Are they just for greenware? I know that they have to contain zinc oxide uh, and that they are fired to con six, but what makes them special and different from other glazes? Thank you. Love your podcast. Bye. Wow, that takes me back to, mm. um, mm -hmm. you know, that was a really great and important book and i'm just wondering what edition she's translated just now and i i don't yeah, know i don't I'd know the last edition published here in the states i'm i'm looking i can't see my copy over there well uh, while we look that up producer ben um <laughs> <laughs> so do you do you want to give us a definition of what a bristol glaze is yeah some people may, may never have heard of a bristol glaze they're they're not that common no i don't think they're common i think people use them and don't even realize they're bristol glaze right right, right. Yeah, it was a thing though when like when i was a clay baby for sure oh absolutely and they still mm. are a thing they're, they're definitely out there so we got to go back to talk about glaze temperature because uh justina mentioned um cone six so when we talk about the basic chemistry of a glaze glazes are made up of glass formers silicon alumina and fluxes and the fluxes bring down the melting temperature of the glass warmers because they melt at a really high temperature. The lowest possible temperature you can make stable glazes is, is cone 10. And that's why cone 10 is cone 10. That's when those four materials work together effectively. When you need to get under cone 10, you need to do something else to the chemistry because those don't work. 90% of the time, 
in the contemporary context, people use boron. They use materials like Fritz, like 3134 or 3124, or they'll use something like Gersley borate, or we've talked in previous episodes about borate substitutions like Gillespie borate or things like that. So those are all using boron, and boron is a lower temperature glass former that works under cone 10. So that's what those are in there. So if you have a cone 6 recipe and it's got a Frit in it, that's really to bring that temperature down. Fritz, though, are using boron, and boron is actually a very rare element. Boron is only has two major, major deposits in the world. One is in Turkey, and that's where a lot of Europeans and Asian folks will get their boron sources from. And the other one is in the United States in Southern California. There's a huge boron deposit, and that's where Gersley borate originally came from. And then there's, there's literally a town called Boron, California, that's owned by the U.S. Borax Corporation. And that, oh, I think we need to go people, there. We do. We do. <laughs> that's, that's a road trip. Yeah. Field trip. <laughs> Torture our children. Um, <laughs> but if you don't have boron, because historically, like, People didn't ship materials all over the way. How are you going to get your temperature down and get a stable glaze? Well, historically, people would use lead. That's what lead glazes were, is that lead works at lower temperatures. But the other alternative of a lead-free alternative was what they call a Bristol glaze. And a Bristol glaze, the origin is controversial. Bristol, England tries to take credit from it. That's where the name Bristol comes from. It was probably actually developed in the U.S. That's what history points towards the chemistry being from. But anyway, what it is, is that it's a special chemical reaction that takes place between zinc and calcium. Okay, zinc and calcium are both alkaline earth fluxes. All of our glazes have two fluxes, an alkali metal on the first column of the periodic table and alkaline earth from the second one. Well, zinc and calcium are both alkaline earth fluxes, but when you combine zinc and calcium in the right proportion, you get what we call a eutectic. And a eutectic is a really cool chemical reaction. I love that word. It's a, such mm -hmm. a great it's word. It's a good word, yeah. <laughs> and a nice gallery. <laughs> <laughs> it is a nice gallery. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, a eutectic is when you take two materials and they've got a natural bottom melting temperature, but when you combine them, they create a chemical reaction that creates a temperature that melts lower than either of them could naturally achieve. Now, the first thing that I have to say is the vast majority of people in ceramics use the word eutectic wrong. You hear people often use the term eutectic to just refer to fluxing, like that silica melts at a high temperature and that they'll say, oh, well, the fluxes are creating a eutectic. Eh, wrong, absolutely incorrect. That is just fluxing. A eutectic is taking that minimum temperature that that flux would get you to and pushing it even farther than the material naturally can. It's a special chemical reaction. And so the Bristol glaze is one of these eutectics. By combining zinc and calcium in the right proportion, they will go under cone 10. They're generally conceived of as being cone six, but they can actually go as low as cone two. I'm not saying to do that because it usually has to do with brick and long firings and all that kind of thing. But that's really what it is, is that we're creating temperatures under cone 10 using materials that are more common because lots of places will have zinc and calcium available as materials when they, when they wouldn't have had boron or didn't want to use lead. Hmm. Oh, and Ben, you found out what addition. I think it's edition four. And if you guys look up craft and the art of clay in Polish, you will find that website. It took the whole time Matt was talking to figure out the oh, website. Easy. And okay. I can't say the website. A lot of consonants <laughs> together, but it means craft and art of clay. <laughs> Polish wow. is a beautiful language. I mean, well, translation's hard enough, but I can I mad respect for Justina for you know being able to do all the technical lingo as well. And God, yeah. that's that's something else. Well, everybody, that's all the time we have. We can go curl up with our <laughs> Polish version of clay <laughs> um, and try and try and learn more about it. But um, until we see each other again and answer more great questions, see you later, Rose and Matt. And producer Ben. See ya. <laughs> later, y'all. Bye. Well, folks, that's it for this week's episode of For Flux Sake. I'd like to thank the listeners who submitted questions this week. And if you want your question answered on the show, shoot us an email at forfluxsakepodcast at gmail.com. So join us next time. And when in your studio, remember what Rose always says. 
always remember to test, test, test. This is a test of the emergency glaze system. Beep.